um, some challenges there in terms of how you characterized Sweden. Yeah. Well, I think it's not just how I characterize Sweden. Um, you know, I when I when I speak about the Ugandan story w w and and I speak about the gap between the laws and the implementation, someone said to me, "At least the laws are aspirational." Um, so it's the <laughs> it's the same approach. Um, I I I. My first comment is this, is as someone who's interested in management processes and processes of implementation, I think it's fantastic to be in a meeting that's talking about how do we do things rather than what we do. And, and I, I would have to say that the first goal of my book was to bring this onto the agenda so that we're not talking about multi-year budgeting or meritocratic civil service hiring or, or whatever it is, but we're talking about how do you do change. And, and this kind of conversation is really interesting. Uh, I think also that all of the tensions that you have on the final slide are, 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 are valid tensions. And I think uh, they raise a bunch of very interesting questions about how we do reform and what we want to do. And, and I would be the first to say that, um, that, that my book is one of many on the topic. Uh, and hopefully many more. And hopefully much more conversation. Um, because I think that that's the point. The point is that we need to be talking about how we're doing this better so that we can improve our performance. And we need to understand better where things worked and why they worked and, and what makes them work. So, so I'm not, I'm not going to respond necessarily by defending all of my approaches because, because I, you know, I, I see the tensions. And I see the tensions that Philip raises as well. You know, someone said to me, you know, the Nazis were really, really adaptive. And I say, they, they truly were, right? You know, they, they really were. And that, that, you know, you can tell me that that's a problem and maybe that is a problem, but it's also a reality. You know, I'd also tell you that, you know, the, 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 the South Koreans were when they led their country to rapid growth and they did a bunch of things that we don't want to remember. Um, so the world is messy and the world is a place where we, I think we still have to ask a lot of questions and I think that it's great to have this final slide there because I think it raises those questions. But the key thing is we need to be asking them and we don't ask them enough. And uh, I would actually say this, I would say that the tensions are there because sometimes you need adaptation and sometimes you need a new design. And sometimes a hybrid is going to be the thing you need to do and sometimes you're going to take a solution off the shelf and it's going to be optimal. And it, it behooves us to work out which is which. You know, my colleague Land Pritchett says s I there are many different problems to solve. And solving the problem that requires you to build a road is different to solving the problem that, desires that, that requires you to build a government. And they require different strategies. And maybe, you know, where we end up is, is, is an approach where we kind of say, what is the typology of problems that we have and what are the potential responses? And how do we kind of work out this tension uh, in, in a more creative way? But again, I don't think that that's a conversation we have very much in development. And I don't think it's a conversation we have very much in management either. We take whatever the, the cool book is at the time and we kind of run with it. So the first thing I would say is um, I think all of these are valid. And, and I think it's a, it's, it's a tension that uh, I grappled with a lot in the book as well. That said, a couple of the things I think I would, I would change a little bit because I don't know if, I, if I'm arguing that it's champions and entrepreneurs versus broad engagement. I think I'm arguing for all three of them. And even, you know, when the, the, the chapter where I discuss the champions, uh, where I discuss the need for broad engagement is the Mozambican reforms in the public finance sector. And it's a place where I work a lot. And, and there, what I saw was you need a champion, and they had a champion. And you need a group of entrepreneurs. And you're right, they're small. And, and they had a group of entrepreneurs. Um, and they're tremendously, tremendously effective entrepreneurs, and they developed an incredible system. Um, but the third one is they didn't get the broad engagement, either with the parliament or with the people who had to use the system that they developed. So the question is... How far can the champion take you? And you know, what does that group of entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs need look like? When do, you, when do you go for the broad engagement and with whom? And how do you do it? Um, so you know, my sense is it's, it's, it's all of the above. But again, that's a kind of a, a, a something that a lot of people don't like because you know, they, don't, you know, they want a, a champion or entrepreneurs. I think it's all. In the study where we went and we looked at who led, it was interesting because the, the numbers were not the same. We actually asked the question, at the, we said, 
When this started, who led? And the numbers were smaller than we said, how many are leading now? And it became interesting to me because it, it kind of resonates with your story is when you're starting a reform, you generally have a smaller group of entrepreneurs doing very, very focused things. But the question is that, you know, the reforms go through time. And as you move out, your, your group of people who are taking risks and playing entrepreneurial roles grows uh, because they have to reach people and the distribution issue becomes an issue, the, the issue of diffusion. So I actually think you and I agree, even on your story, uh, I maybe just need to write better than I do, uh, which, is, which is which my wife would completely agree with. Um, uh, you know, the, the, the part of the story in, in, in Sweden that I love the most is the packaging and the, the how, did you, how did you penetrate the context, which again, I think I would agree with everything. And, and again, maybe the language I use is not the same. Um, but the idea of constructing the problem and, 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 that, and, and I loved your message, you know, so many crises that we see don't, don't, don't yield the responses that, you, that they need. And, and I think this is what I loved about your story is the idea that you guys didn't just take the crisis, you used the crisis to construct a problem using data, using information um, in a way that got people's attention, in a way that could clearly say this is a PFM issue and we need to solve the budget problems. And, and you know, in the book I speak about constructing problems in that way and it's probably the thing that's got the most traction when I'm working with actual reformers is 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 that it's a technique to say to people if you really want to move stuff you have to say what is the problem and how do i bring the research and the data etc to bear so uh, and i think that that's how you're dealing with the con the, with 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 the contextual constraints um so you know i don't want to spend all my time talking about your 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 comments because i thought they were all salient and i'm writing them down because i'm learning but one of the things also in the book that I think is important is the idea of lessons of reforms that either failed or, succeed or succeeded are, are, I think, the place where we're going to crack this nut. And that's why I was enjoying listening to this, and I would encourage a lot more people, when you're going into a reform process, uh, or if you're the advisor in the reform process, learn from the lessons of people who've done this. And, and this is my biggest concern with the donor community is that I think the donor community gets a, a menu of things that look like they've worked in places and they don't ask enough questions about how they worked, which is essentially the, the story about you know, the US person who came out and said the fiscal council was the thing that made a difference, which is a completely incorrect rendering of the story. Um, but it's easy to do if you don't take the time to actually say what happened and to find the people who can teach you uh, w w what occurred. And that's essentially what I think we should take away is if you want to engage in institutional change, it's a very hard thing to do. I think the Swedish story shows that it can happen in fairly, in shortish periods of time, that it can happen without gaps. Um, but we need to pay serious attention to how we do it. Thank you. Thanks very much, Matt. Um, I'm also... Um, interested in your idea that the whole uh, massive industry of governance metrics might have <coughs> broadly a perverse impact on the world as well. I think that's um, the way you outline that, I think, is um, interesting and um, has, a lot, has, a, has a bit of force. So that's also something provocative to take on. But for the moment, I think Pear's list of um, issues for discussion is unimprovable. <laughs> so I'll leave that up there and um, start taking comments, questions, distributed leadership, whatever, from the floor. We'll start there. Hi, uh, Antoine Vendemortel from Morris Studies, King's College, London. Uh, I think part of the book, or the message that I got from your presentation, is much, much about hybridity. And the question about hybridity is that either you try to get the development community to forget about the illusion that you can do good governance, and instead replace that with the possibility through your PDAI process of good enough governance. Mm -hmm. And is it possible or how do you think you can change the expectations and the belief of the donor community from this kind of illusion of good governance and move it to good enough governance? Or you think that the process that you bring, hybridity is only a step towards the end game, yeah. which rem you have hybridity, good enough governance, and with that you move to good governance as the end point. So how do you manage the expectations and the belief of the donor community? 
in that sense. Thank you. Thank you. There was another question here. Yep. Uh, yeah, thank you so much for the um, presentation and the discussion. Yeah, can you introduce comments. yourself? Yes, sure, for sure. My name is Teo Dutch Mogus. I'm with the International Food Policy Research Institute, or IFPRI. I, I really want to start with um, the last point of uh, Dr. Molander's, uh, with this, which is about the donor community. And it's good to hear that there is actually a chapter that speaks directly to that, because in, to some extent, if we leave out the you know rapidly merging markets, India, China, and so forth, willy-nilly, donors will be a critical element of institutional change, maybe for the better, for the worse, or you know, helping or hurting, but I don't think they will be left out or can be left out, I guess. Um, and with regard to that, I, mean, I was thinking about the comments you had um, when you, know, you have either in the olden days adjustment loans and nowadays policy lending or however they're, they're referred, and you have sort of uh, uh, conditionalities on uh, certain laws coming into place, uh, seed laws or whatever it may be. And we see that then they're either poorly implemented, left by the wayside, whatever. And I can't imagine that donors, even if they don't have the, the academic expertise on institutional theory, especially those who are around for a long time, won't see after, say, a decade of, of uh, laws that are not happening, won't see that um, these types of uh, reforms backed by finances often don't even take place or bar barely take place, leave alone whether they take place and fail. So I guess my question to you is how can we bring in the thinking about the role, um, the constraints, the interests, the incentives on the donor side, um, maybe in some kind of game theoretic framework between governments and donors to, to better understand how, yeah. why this persists um, despite decades of experience, bad experience. Thanks, two, gr two great questions there. Yeah, I'll take one more and then go back to the panel at this point here. I think, thank you. All right, um, I'm Molly Faust from uh, the VET MPA program at the LSE. And I had two very quick questions. First, um, this entrenched habits of the donor community that you talk about, seems like there's also a lot of entrenched habits on the receiving end as well. Um, and how, what suggestions do you have that would allow people on the receiving end, both the citizens and the governments, to actually not expect to have best practices pushed on them, but actually think on their own? Yeah. And then second, um, what incentives do these governments have to actually change to that system, because if they have the ability to just say, oh yes, 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 we'll do these things, and then they get a lot of money, and then they leave office, um, yeah. you know, what incentives do they actually have to, to do those changes? Thanks very much. Um, Matt, do you want to kick off just with sure. some thoughts on that? Um, so, you know, the, the I, I th actually think uh, all, all three questions are, are related to each other. So. Uh, you know, it's this idea of you have an industry and that industry does things and it's not an industry of hybridity and it's an industry of solutions and, and you know, I, I, I even think that uh, the issue in, 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 in them isn't it's hybrids versus optional solutions, I th uh, optimal solutions. I think that oftentimes it's very obvious that the practices, or, or to me, it's very obvious that the solutions that are trying to be put into places are not going to be optimal. So th the, the issue is a little different. But the question is kind of how do you um, how how do you how do you move this situation? And you know the first thing is you said do, don't the donors see the problem? Um, it's a great question, and that's in chapter ten. One of the things I ask is I, I essentially say you know the entrenched structures. How do you think about change? And and um, I draw on the work of Kathleen Thelen here. So uh, in in institutional theory, who 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 essentially says there are four kind of dimensions of change. The one thing is you, you, nothing is tabula rasa, right? So there are institutions that exist there already. So how entrenched are they? And my question is kind of, what is the dominance of the incumbent structures? How dominant are they? Are they? Is it likely that if you're looking at the donor community and you're looking at the relationship between donors and governments, that things are going to change? Or are the incentive structures so, so strong that you're just not going to shift it? The second thing is related is, are there any alternatives? Because, you know, if you say, well, you know, it's not working, but we don't know what we're going to take you to. You just need to change. Yeah, that's not going to get you anywhere. So uh, the third thing is kind of what is the, the, the agents? And this is kind of what Per was saying is, you know, who is for this and who is against it? Who stands to lose? H who do you have that's going to push for this and who do you have that's going to push against it? And kind of how does that land up? 
And, and the, the fourth one is then what I call disruption, because I don't want to speak about crisis, is, is how disrupted is the system? And all four of these work together, right? Is you need some disruption, but you need a weakened status quo, you need an alternative, and you need uh, the agents who are going to shift you. And in, the, in, in, in chapter 10, I essentially say, uh, this, is, this, this gives you the size of the hole that you're going to have for change, and how big is that in the international development community? Um, and my argument is kind of there are reasons to think that it's big and there are reasons to think it's non-existent. Um, and, and, you know, in the book, I kind of don't go into what I think because that's another book. Um, but I, I do think that there are a few things that, uh, that, that I think kind of worry me. Um, the first one is a question, is it a problem? If, if your organization has the, name, has the word fund in it or bank, we have to seriously ask if, if, if the projects that you are doing are there to create governments or to move money. And the observation that I have is that a lot of these reforms fail significantly and we see they fail significantly and the organizations don't hide that fact because their evaluations show that they don't succeed. Not only do they continue, but this is the fastest growing area in their portfolio. The fastest growing by, by, by leaps and bounds. So money is moving into this area. Money is moving significantly. And I think that that creates a, a key issue is, you know, if that's moving and you are called the World Bank and task team leaders are assessed on how many projects they have and how big the projects they, are, uh, they have are, and in DFID we're decre decreasing the amount of money that goes to administrative staff and we're increasing the size of loans uh, because we think that's the way that you are more efficient at things. It, it, it becomes a money game and maybe not a change game. And, I, I, you know, a, a, as I say, that's a reason to believe that, you know, we, we may have a, a really, really steep hill to climb. On the other hand, the organizations are being more self-aware um, of the limits and, 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 and of the weaknesses. And the 2008 report of, of the IEG of the World Bank, I think, was, was, was a, a very, very honest reflection of their work, and that's very interesting. So, you know, there are reasons to believe that the, the community is moving, but there are reasons to believe that it may be, be sitting as well. Um, when you get to the level of the individuals and kind of why would, why would you as an individual reproduce the same law again and again? You know, surely after 20 years you see it's not working. There are very, very few countries where development organizations allow people to work for more than three or four or five years. Um, and when you come into a country, it's not as if you have someone giving you the kind of the, the, the blow by blow history of what happened. And um, if you have a, a, an official working in government who proves to be effective on a reform program, they probably get taken up by the IMF and the World Bank too. So there are a lot of issues with institutional memory in these places, which, which really does allow for the same things to come up, and up, up again and again and people are not aware of it. Um, there's also what in the book, I, it's not my idea, but there's a concept of the cargo cult, which says, you know, ideas that come from the outside, we just think they must be better, and the people who bring them think that they must be better, so they don't necessarily do their homework enough. And I think that that is something that happens. This said, and it kind of, you know, I think the question that Antoine raised was, 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 was what would you do about this? And it actually gets to some of the techniques that, that, that Pierre used in, in uh, in Sweden is, you know, the first thing is we need an equivalent of the, of, of, uh, of, of his graph. Uh, we need something that, that shows not only is it going badly, but you look like Italy. And um, we need to construct the problem in a way that, that, that actually we, we gain attention. Um, it, one of the things that I'm thinking of doing it, and this is where I would go with indicators, because, you know, we do have indicators and I'm a fairly pragmatic person. Um, and I think there will be indicators on governance in the post-2015 set of indicators. So I would say, instead of having indicators that basically give you an average score on how good does your system look, and you end up getting good-looking governance that is not good governance, what I would say is we actually have indicators now where we can calculate the gap between what you look like and how you function. And maybe what we should focus on, and we should focus the development organizations and the countries on closing the gaps on the functional operation of their systems and basically say that's what you have to look like. I think if we can construct the problem and show 
what I'm trying to do is say in 86% of developing countries, the gap is significant. And if we can actually put that in play and say, that's not what developed countries look like. You're not doing the same thing. And construct that problem and get enough of a community talking about that, I think that we might be able to push for a set of indicators that make more sense in terms of stopping this process of a new law every four years and actually saying, the law you have is good enough. Close the gap between its implementation and what it looks like. Um, I, I think uh, the second thing that I would suggest is is that we need to build our own community of people and it's one of the reasons why I came to London is I'm not the only person who's making these observations and I, I would assume that there are many people in this room who are saying I see this it's something I care about uh, it, part of it is you know we need to build our own community so that we can create a message that people do listen to and I don't really know how to do that because you know academics are not very good at working with people um, but it's a little bit like what, you know, when Per uh, engaged with the parliamentarians and Per engaged, you create a, constitu a constituency of people or a coalition of people who, who want to push for something new. So the first one is I think we need, to, uh, we, we need to be able to say there's a disruption in the status quo doesn't work. The second thing is we need to assemble the agents against this or, or for change. And the third thing is I think we need to be practical about what the alternatives are. Now, the reason why in the book I wrote chapters 7, 8, and 9 was because Danny Roderick, with whom, I'm work, say, with whom I work, at one point came into my office and said to me, I'm really tired of you saying that, saying that the development organizations do it badly. And I'm tired of you measuring how, how badly we've done it. I want you to find examples of where things work. And so I added chapters 7, 8, and 9. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I did research to try and find out how that worked. Um, but I do think that the conversation about how that worked is, is still one that obviously isn't resolved because we have these things on the board. But I think that if we seriously want to go to the development organizations and say we need to do it differently, we have to say what different looks like. And what different looks like needs to be something that the development organizations can conceivably move to. And at the moment, I don't think we're kind of there. I think PDIA may be a step to help in that direction in the conversation, but I think that's something we need to be serious about. Critics who just say that you've got it wrong don't really hold the floor for very much in this community. That's great. Thanks very much, Matt. I'm going to go to this side of the room, then over the other. Sheila, do you want to start? Uh, <coughs> thank you, uh, Sheila Page, ODI. Several times, Matt, you've referred to the Swedish experience as being quick. It wasn't, was it? I mean, the, crisis, the, the problem had been developing for years, and then the solution was relatively quick. But isn't there a case for saying that uh, timing should be in this, that you actually need, you can only do the sorts of things Sweden did at the time when it did it, after you'd, uh, in a sense, you, you've tried all the wrong things first, and then you try the right things? Yeah. And uh, you've also referred to a lot of institutional reforms as being failures. That's because you assume they were intended to reform institutions. If they were intended to extract aid from donors, they weren't. Absolutely. They were successes. Yeah. So I do think you need to be a little careful about what you call a failure and what you call a success. Absolutely. If no one actually wants an institution and recipients want money and the uh, donors want to get the money out, then you have a very sensible set of policies. Yep. Uh, sensible in inverted commas. You also, uh, having said we shouldn't just copy things because we have to work out how they were done, not what was done, but you want us to copy the uh, Swedish diagram showing Sweden in penultimate place. That worked for Sweden because Sweden expects to be at the top. If you had shown that same chart to Greece, would it have worked? <laughs> Thanks, Sheila. I think we had a question next to Sheila and then we'll go to the back. I think it was actually better put um, there. But um, I remember reading... I read Can you introduce yourself, Sorry. Uh, my name's Samed Rao. I'm from the GSDRC. Um, I remember reading an earlier a draft of a paper um, on PDIA, thinking oh, it was a great idea, but it's probably not going to work. My first thoughts were, how is there going to be a political space for failure? The idea of iteration is the idea that you try something and it fails. And I can't see donor agencies saying, OK, we, here's some money, do what you want, and if you fail, it's all right. Mm -hmm. At the moment, and then you say sort of indicators, it's true, they kind of, there's indicators are weak and there's problems with indicators, but the current culture, at least in the UK, is quite 
based on indicators. The sort of new public management philosophy is we'll give you money, show us what you've done with it, yeah. and prove it. Yeah. So I kind of wonder if you know this book should be about the limits of institutional reform to do institutional reform. How do you reform those institutions that are in charge of reforming institutions when they've got sort of all these constraints? Thanks very much. Uh, Heidi at the mic. Hi, I'm Heidi from the uh, Heidi Tavakoli from the Overseas Development Institute. Um, this leads on from a point that Philip made about what do you do in a situation where PDIA doesn't exist? How can that best be facilitated? Um, are there things that donors essentially can encourage local actors to do. And I just want to um, put a plug really for a piece of research we've been carrying out, and Matt knows about this, where we've actually examined eight aid programs that have helped uh, facilitate government efforts to address specific governance constraints, thereby strengthening institutional reform. And we noted in those cases that they were successful because they try to facilitate change by building up what existed yeah. and sort of going beyond policy dialogue. And they did that, we felt in a way, um, they did that by emulating perhaps PDIA themselves. So they themselves had to be quite process driven, adaptive, learning about what worked and what didn't work. Um, so perhaps that's just something you can reflect on. Thanks very much, Heidi. I think one question down at the front again. Uh, thank you. My name is Said. I am uh, I'm attending here as a, as an independent. Right. Um, the f my first question is, uh, Mr. Peer, concerning about the difficulties of reform in the third world countries. I think the three things that has been listed has been a bit simplistic, and uh, in my view, it would not be. Um, uh, correct to put all the th developing countries in one box and, yeah. and, and think that they fit in that box. If they do, I w it would be interesting to see examples that they actually uh, do. Uh, to my view, it is uh, the reform process is um, multiple, there are multiple uh, factors that affect, is complex environment and it is also uh, environmental, environmental envi it it, it also ha happens in different environments and in different contexts. Yeah. So uh, I would uh, well like to hear if you have any empirical research or, or, or arguments that supports that these are indeed the three factors that uh, all the development countries has, 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 has in common. Or is it just one of those ideas like the ones in World Bank or IMF do they come to the country and say this is at the prescription that you have to follow, otherwise you will not get money. Uh, the, other, the other thing is that I understand, I fully support with the idea of identifying a problem. My question would be, who would be <laughs> the best entity or the, pe uh, the best actor that can identify? Yeah. Is it the uh, yeah, uh, donor community, local community, uh, experts as some people say, who I don't know what we mean by that, uh, who who would be the best the, the best the best people to to identify, uh, and that one uh, is a question to uh, to Matt. Uh, also, uh, I do support in the proud engagement of any reform process, any reform process, uh, because I have seen many many uh, so-called uh, reform projects that were not successful as they were designed because there was no sustainability element built in it. Yeah. And once it has the project finished, evaluated, successful or unsuccessful, it dies. Yeah. Because there was no um, long-term sustainability and ownership of the project itself. So how your literature, your, your, your arguments can support yeah. uh, build some sort of uh, sustainable and ownership the, uh, 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 of the reform process. Yeah. Perhaps the reform process might be the same, process might be similar throughout, but it has to be uh, context specific as well as uh, uh, problem specific, to my view. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Pear, would you like to take up the, a couple of the points? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, 
Um, well, uh, I, I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, uh, any kind of list like this is uh, is an oversimplification almost by definition. So uh, I don't claim to be um, d delivering <coughs> the sort of the the final account uh, of, of anything uh, as complex as, as um, development. Um, the, the reason why I pulled together th these um, aspects, uh, if like so par particular difficulties in, in, in some environments, is that if I sort of reiterate my, my own footsteps from my presentation earlier, is that I, I believe our societal institutions are essentially moral norms writ large okay um, the a budget restriction an expenditure ceiling or whatever is the institutional material expression of the norm you shouldn't spend more than you have yeah. which is very simple and comprehensible to any any person in the street um, transparency requirements are basically uh, you should be open about what you are doing. Uh, if you are not, there's probably something fishy going on. Um, there's a, a good classical paper by Robert Goodin called The, the Laundering of Preferences, uh, written in the 1980s, I, if I remember correctly, um, which argues uh, convincingly that if you force people to come out in the open arena, explain what they're doing and why they're doing it, certain types of behavior, certain modes will not be feasible anymore because they are y you cannot defend them in the public arena. They are, they are possible only as long as you can operate uh, clandestinely. Okay. So, so the my, my, my selection of these dimensions is based more on abstract argument than on, on the kind of, of ambitious and, and very solid empirical work that, that Matt engages in. Um, about the donors uh, and, and the recipients, um, I have a fairly pessimistic outlook <laughs> on the world. I, I don't know if I. Sh I think I sh we share that actually. Uh, let, let's call it. Let's call it constructive pessimism. But I have three. <laughs> I have three positive chapters. <laughs> yes. Yes. Um, but I mean, again, among the donors, there are so many other priorities among the donor nations than getting development started, and, and uh, there, there are national aspirations. There are among the countries that used to have empires there is some underlying ambition to maintain those empi empires in a in a different regime um, and and as i said th there are individual incentives which are very tricky to to come to grips with uh, i'll give you one more anecdote if uh, if you permit me uh, concerning the nationalistic agenda uh, five, six years ago, I was contacted by a firm working, uh, I was a private consultant and, and uh, working, I was working as an under consultant to this firm, uh, actually Austrian based, uh, working in, in, in PFM area. And uh, they needed uh, somebody who could go to a country in Central Africa to uh, complete a work th which was half finished. There had been a French consultant uh, working, but he had to go home for family reasons. So th they needed somebody who could come at short notice. Um, this was an EU finance project. As you know, EU is the single largest donor uh, in, the, in the international. It was very important how EU behaves. Um, and uh, okay, I, I, I sort of satisfied his requirements. I could go at short notice. I knew the topic and I speak French and so on. So I seem to fit the, the, the requirements. So he su suggested my name, sent my CV to the local EU representative in this country, who happened to be a French official. Of course, it's a French speaking country, uh, former part of the Franco-Belgian uh, global empire. And uh, after looking at my CV, he said no. 
um, okay, and then and, and this contact person at the firm said, I mean, what's wrong? This guy has, uh, uh, well, he's overqualified. <laughs> sorry, sorry, that's not on the map. I mean, I mean uh, you, you satisfy the, the requirements and, and, and the, uh, that's, that's not a reason. Well, in the end, uh, it turned out that this guy, the local French official representing the European Union, required that it be a French or possibly a Belgian expert. The Swede wouldn't do. Uh, so, I mean, there, there is a, there's a nationalistic agenda in these old uh, colonies still on. And how are you supposed to fit uh, sort of a public interest, a general development interest with that sort of restriction that, that, that we want to maintain the uh, Francophone uh, dominance in this former French-Belgian colony? That th those types of experiences make me pessimistic. Thank you very much, Pat. Matt, can you just uh, respond quickly? I sure. want to make sure we get one more round, and Philip, uh, I'll ask you to I'll, 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 I'll tell Sheila, uh, I, I agree with everything that you say, and if I, if uh, uh, the book is ho ho hopefully speaks better for myself than I did in my words. The issue with quick, quick, nothing is quick, right? This but the point of the Swedish experience is in the book. I tell the story of of fiscal reform in Argentina, uh, which I say, you know, why history repeats itself. And it started at the same time. So it's a little bit the argument that some people respond to me and say, you know, well, I, I, these, I, 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 someone said to me, well, you know, you really are underestimating how long these things take to change. And, you know, Gordon Brown says that the problem with rule of law reform is the first 500 years. And, you know, you're being disrespectful to, and, you know, my sense is uh, in 20 years we should have done better. And, and that's it. So, so that's why I say relatively. But you're absolutely right. The problems were incubating for a long time. And it's the interesting part of the story actually was kind of how long these things had been, had been incubating and how previous reforms had not solved them. And so that's why I actually think the story is very interesting for developing countries. Um, the issue of failure and success, I completely agree with you. I, I do talk about it, and it, it is an issue. Um, and you know, I don't think that they should take exactly Sweden's uh, graph. But the idea is that you need to take the strategy of if you want to affect institutional change, you have to construct the problems so in a way that people pay attention to it. And, and we never do that, never. I, I mean, I've, I, I worked for a number of years, never ever did that. So it's more the strategy rather than the actual graph. Although I do find that you know, the graph uh, is, is a very good way of getting people to see how devious they were. Um, <laughs> but um, uh, in terms of the results, you know, creating space for failure, who asked the question? I mean, did you not listen to the presentation? Uh, we, we have a, it, so this is so interesting to me because, you know, when I present at the bank, they say, well, we don't think we're going to have space for failure, you know? And I say to them, but you guys are failing. <laughs> it's, 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 it's weirdly pathological. It's, it's, it's really weirdly, but then it does get to the thing of, are we failing if we move money? It, that complicated argument begins. But you're absolutely right. In bureaucracies, this is a question of thing. Now, where are we actually doing this? So, you know, where we've gone from the book, myself, Lance, and Michael, is we're basically saying, can we do this in places? And what I'm finding is that um, the, the relationship of organizations and results is a strange one, especially in development. And especially, you know, the, U the UK is moving for value for results, et cetera, which means that they do an assessment every year and they ask very lame questions about things that they guarantee they're going to get. This is why we get stuck with laws, right? What I'm finding is that actually it gets to, the, the last question was who defines the problems? Local people, okay? It depends on the problem, but it has to be local because that's a key part of ownership. And if you get a minister to, to, to risk doing this PDA stuff, right? Given the fact that their life is spent uh, signaling to the donors and that actually doing this is, is, is problematic for them, they say to you, I want to know what we've done after three weeks. So actually the results timetable goes like this. That's why you iterate, right? When I speak about iteration, I'm not speaking about a pilot that takes 15 years. I'm saying we're going to get the guys together and we're going to say to them, you know, okay, for five years you guys haven't been able to put a database together. What data would have been in the database? And they'll say this, this, and this. And you say, does any of that data exist? And mostly the answer is absolutely. So you say, let's say we're in two weeks' time, we're going to have an Excel spreadsheet and all those data, all that data is going to be in the spreadsheet. Start with the first step, right? 
three weeks time you take it to the minister and you say mr minister you never had this data before it's in an excel spreadsheet the donors won't accept this as a significant thing but the minister looks at it and says i can make decisions i could never make before now that doesn't take six months but you actually have to be seriously accountable in very very short periods of time once you do that you penetrate it you make them a little more functional you get yourself more legitimacy you move to the next step but so the process of this to get with this result thing is you actually have to commit to a, a, a much tighter performance timeline where the performance is in smaller bites. But every time you, you, you achieve that, you build a bit more political support. My sense is that this is the approach that you would have to take within the donor community as well, is you would almost have to say to them, you guys are being pushed towards results, and we're actually going to do results on steroids. Okay. Thanks very much, Matt. Uh, Claire, we go to this side. Um, Claire Melamed from, from ODI. I think I'm sort of feeling slightly confused by this conversation. I think we're having two conversations here, one of which is about how institutional reform happens in countries, any country, in Sweden, in Uganda, you know, what's the sort of different um, role of different in internal coalitions to make it happen, et cetera, et cetera, and that's, you know, a really interesting and important conversation to have. The second conversation, which is what most of the Q&A is focused on, is what is the role of outsiders, in this case donors, in making that happen in a particular subgroup of countries which happen to have to accept outsider input because they're dependent on aid. And I have to say I'm finding this quite a sort of difficult and uncomfortable thing to, to listen to, and it seems to me there's quite a contradiction here because if what we're saying is that you know, this is a very context specific, a very political process. It's highly contingent on the kind of development of internal coalitions and the effective operation of internal politics to make change happen in a positive way. And then at the same time, we're saying, and yet these kind of traditionally rather flat footed outsiders have a useful role in coming in and doing something about it. I'm just finding a bit of a contradiction there. It seems to me there are kind of three possible ways of moving that forward. I mean, the first would be, as Philip alluded to in his presentation, to kind of say, well, actually, you know, all the experience tells us that institutional reform isn't something that aid is very good at driving or that donors are very good at advising on, and maybe we just get out and spend the money on vaccines where we know that we can have a good effect. That's one possibility. If we think that probably donors are, either there is a positive role for donors or that pragmatically donors are just too wedded to this agenda to ever get out of it, then there is an approach which we seem to be taking implicitly in this conversation, which is to say, you know, let's try and do it better. Let's stick to this kind of quite technocratic language that donors are happy with, and yet somehow make what we do under the guise of that quite technocratic approach more appropriate to the complex internal politics of any process and somehow try to sort of straddle that divide a bit. Um, or three, it seems to me there's a third option, which perhaps we haven't talked about yet, which is to kind of acknowledge this is a very political process and to say, yeah, what we're doing when we, as outsiders, come and intervene in the politics of any given country, it's not a technical process, it's a political process. And actually what we're doing is going back to a much more traditional kind of 1970s <coughs> approach to external assistance, which is, a, you know, we're, talk we're taking sides in other people's arguments. It's a solidarity, you know, it's a solidarity thing we're doing here. We're saying this group of people isn't get what isn't get what they need out of institutions, so we're going to take sides with them and try to change institutions to make that happen. I think <laughs> in some ways that might be a more honest way of describing the role of outsiders, but I can see it's quite uncomfortable. Thanks. Um, then Marta, can we're going to need to move a bit quicker through the questions. I mean, Apologies. just if, I mean, if there's a follow-up from uh, from Claire and to some extent to what Philip said, and I shared that with Matt before. I share the optimism in this book on the on the how and the what, right? I think it tells a great deal about what the problem is, what can be done about it. I'm worried, and I think Matt is also about the who, because whilst there is a lot of useful thinking in there about how at the national level one can see different actors, you know you know, brokering relationship and doing all sorts of muddling in accordance with PDIA. When it comes to the international community, I think you express worries in your chapter 10 about the fact that the rules of the game are not changing. And I think it's fair to say that in the donor community, we're not going, 
in, it doesn't look like we are looking at the third realistic options. We are going back into an, a fairly entrenched positions around, you know, value for money and others. And that's where I think the challenge is, you know, is confronting us. And when you're, you know, in terms of looking forward and what you do with, um, with this work is to take a good, honest look about what did institutions can do. I am, I am convinced by your ideas that there are plenty of individuals and stories of people that, despite the systems and on the margins, are doing yes. PDIA in successful ways. Thank you very much. Um, so I've got a few questions. Well, we'll take and then. I, um, Ruth Larby from ODI as well. I just um, wanted to touch on something that draws on several different threads, but it's about the typology of problems that you were mentioning. So kind of categorizing the why, why, um, what you threads you can draw across different types of problems in a problem-driven um, iterative um, analysis or adaptation analysis. Um, and it seems that the one of the main things that has come out of this discussion that happened with all speakers was the idea that um, Sweden, for example, in that case, it's, is not like Italy or Greece. Um, and so I was wondering, in term, and that was picked up as well in, in this, the way you were positing the problem of um, having external people to the reform environment not involved within the reform process. Um, and also in the packaging idea, like it was very clearly set out there. Um, so I was wondering, do you think that in order to get people to work together for institutional reform, do you think that it is, is it positive, necessary to have identified external enemies, as it were, or negative comparators um, in a numerical way, if, as, as you've shown on these graphs, um, in order to make reform happen? Thanks, Ruth. Um, Simon, and then these last two questions, and then it was just to share a tale of two evaluations. Actually, my wife, who works up in North Ayrshire, has been doing an evaluation of a health project. It's asset-based community development. I explained to her, Matt, you were coming to speak to us, and she said, actually, PDIA is what they've been doing. But rather than start with the problem-driven, they've started with what are the asset, what's the asset base of that community, what are the positive things they've got to share which they can use to, to, to address problems within the community, which is, has resonance with what you've been saying. The other uh, evaluation that PDIA has appeared is we've just been evaluated. The, this is the Budget Strengthening Initiative within um, ODI. And we the, the, the evaluators have picked up your term, problem driven adaptation, in terms of some of the things that we do. We're, we're an arm's length organization. We were originally funded by DFID, but we're working with ministries of finance with them, inside them, on addressing some of the problems they have. So I think there are positive things that are being done, and in a sense there are examples of where donors are funding a more arm's length iterative approach. Thanks. Thanks, Simon. Now here, thanks for your patience. Thanks. Uh, David Goldsworthy from the uh, UK National Audit Office. Um, I'm quite heavily involved in working with public accounts committees and uh, audit offices around the globe. Um, and I would see myself, I suppose, very much as one of those flat-footed outsiders who muddle, uh, muddles through. Um, our work is always, I think, on many in these sorts of fields, um, uh, uh, small p, or even sometimes big p, yeah. uh, political. And I think one of the sort of the issues that's imp a big challenge to the the outsiders is actually often stepping beyond the boundaries of the pre-described project, um, which is sometimes often you know can very much limit the definition of wha what's uh, needed. I've just come back from one country where you know, we've worked with the project alone. I don't think we'd have any real potential for any longer term impacts. But linking in with other p uh, people within the ministries of finance, within the, uh, the parliament, uh, and the organization we're in, then there may be some chances of some uh, small reforms which meet the expectations of the organization. Thank you very much, Andrew, the last one. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Andrew Lawson from Fiscus. Um, thank you to all the speakers for excellent presentations. I wanted to suggest uh, perhaps a, a different perspective for approaching the um, final set of questions on, on, the, uh, on the PowerPoint. Um, and this is really about approaching it from the idea of context and mechanisms. Um, some of you are probably familiar with realist synthesis. And in, in that, the idea is to look at outcomes as a function both of context and of mechanisms. And my sense reading this is that um, Matt, for, for mechanism, read process. And you're quite 
optimistic that the process you've identified is actually translatable to quite a range of contexts. Yeah. Uh, and, and that comes across quite interestingly. Whereas Per seems to be much more uh, concerned of context. Yeah. He's acutely aware that uh, Sweden succeeded because of the particular crisis that was there in 1992 and the particular way in which it was possible to put it forward. So however good his process might have been, if the context hadn't been there, there wouldn't have been success. Yeah. So I suppose my question is whether I'm, I'm pigeonholing you too much or, or whether in fact there is some truth in my uh, appreciation of your judgment. Oh, that was a great round of questions. Philip, would you like to kick off this time because you've been patient up to now? <laughs> Thanks. Sure. I think, I think the, first, the first point that I would like to come back to is this distinction between developing countries and developed countries. I think if, if, there's, if there's anything that I'm absolutely sure of is that there's, to my mind, virtually no difference at all except for how we perceive and conceive these differences uh, and, and then act accordingly. And I think it's just to let Sweden off the hook for a second. If you, if you, look, at, um, if you look at the US, for instance, versus sub-Saharan Africa, if you, you listen to some of the conversations that we had recently about uh, tax collection ratios and, 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 and taxation efforts in developing countries. There's a lot of discussion about that around corrupt elites who are just uh, maliciously refuse to tax their citizens enough and if only they were stopping to waste and be corrupt and tax more and then spend that money better, then development would happen. Therefore, it should become a priority of development pos policy to, to ask developing countries to increase their rates of taxation. If you look at the US and you would you would tell the US federal government your your <coughs> tax take of less than 20% of GDP is abysmal. What 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 sort of a developing country are you? Then the Americans would say, well, that's because of our political culture and we would be mortally offended if the if the federal government uh, collected more taxes. It's all and and even if we wanted to as the government we can't because of the politics. And everyone around the table would sort of nod along and say, well, yeah, of course they can't because of the politics. Look at Democrats and Republicans, and obviously that's never going to happen, so we move on and try something else. Whereas, if for some reason, if you are beyond, below a certain income threshold, then it's totally okay to say, well, then let those politicians get their act together because we are in a hurry. Mm. And, and so at some point then, so for instance, South Africa recently, uh, it was announced that South Africa is not going to receive any more uh, financial assistance from the UK. So it's now a domestic political problem if they are still poor people in South Africa, whereas before it was obviously an aid issue and, and something that was of great concern because they are just as poor, or lots of people are just as poor as they were before. So I think it, it's really worth being quite careful around around these issues. Having said that, I think the, the, the most interesting point was to me from this discussion right now was the one that Sheila made about, about the agency that, that developing country governments really have because very often when we speak about institutional reform, of course we presume that everybody wanted to succeed according to the terms of reference. And so the reason implicitly why institutional reforms fail is because they were too complicated or because they were too hard, or because the political context changed, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's entirely possible, and I think it's incredibly likely, actually, that strategies of signaling, strategies of isomorphic mimicry, strategies of, of, of sort of copying superficial institutions like, like PRSPs, like anti-corruption commissions, like, like all these different things that sound good on paper, have no reality in practice, are an incredibly rational choice response yeah. to the funding environment Absolutely. that you face. Because if you are a government and you have somebody from the World Bank or GIZ or DFID sitting across from you and say, if you don't follow that policy, makers, policy matrix, I'm going to be really cross with you and we are going to cut your funding in the next phase. That's peanuts if you compare it to rich taxpayers who might get really offended and yeah. who might, if, if things got really bad, storm the presidential palace and kill you if you wanted to tax them too much. And so these, these sorts of incentives, I think, we very, very often just don't appreciate at all. And, and I think 
that is maybe one my my main takeaway from this that we better should because otherwise nothing much is going to change. Thank you very much, Philip. Uh, some concluding thoughts. Um, okay. Um, well, the, the the basic recommendation that I would like to put forward is to look uh, in a detailed fashion into all the factors that we have been discussing here tonight. I mean, the, po the, the power structure, who are our friends, who are our enemies, the, the situation, is there a window of opportunity that we could exploit for pulling this reform through, uh, etc. All that takes a lot of knowledge, uh, detailed knowledge of, of the country that one is operating in, and both on sort of the political structure and, and, and the economy, etc. Um, I would like to strike a more positive note and I'll sort of balance what I s <laughs> said <laughs> earlier. Um, and that's the, the, the phrase politically possible, which was used here uh, a while ago. Um, when I was developing this reform, uh, I was told by most of my colleagues in the Ministry of Finance that what you are trying to do is politically impossible. Uh, well, I didn't care, and it turned out to be politically possible. And if there is anything that should be left to politicians, it's judging what is politically possible. That should not be done by civil servants. Okay, mm -hmm. and and uh, I would say uh, on a more positive note that that uh, the 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 spectrum of the of the politically possible is most often larger than you believe. And, and there's a risk that you limit your own freedom of action by, by mm -hmm. underestimating it. I mean, going back to the 1980s, it was, of course, politically impossible to throw out the communist regimes in Eastern Europe. But fortunately, the, the peoples of Eastern Europe were unaware of this, this uh, political impossibility, so they went ahead and did it. And, and so we are seeing a totally different Europe today. I, I will pay homage to the host nation here by uh, quoting uh, one of its uh, great poets, uh, T.S. Eliot. Um, in the 50s, there emerged in the United States uh, a new type of literary criticism called the New Criticism. And um, well, a lot of fancy ideas on how to analyze poetry and, and fiction uh, more generally. And the French developed their own version of this uh, La Nouvelle Critique, which was their sort of new criticism. And uh, after some time of sort of haggling back and forth across the Atlantic, uh, uh, T.S. Eliot stepped up and, and um, commented on this debate and said, the only method in literary criti criticism is to be very intelligent. And uh, my... Uh, uh, translation of this into the topic that we've been discuss discussing here is the only method in institutional reform is to be very intelligent. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks very much, Pear. Um, Matt, so there's lots of stuff there. Okay. Can you let pick me, out uh, some concluding let points? Let me be yeah. um, I mean, I think the, the, you know, let me jump on the, the last gentleman's comment. There's a lot of this work that's been done. I mean, you're sitting next to Alan and Sipfa, you know, what I love about SIPFA is SIPFA is its work tackles the bottom of the iceberg, seriously does. Uh, and, 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 and I think there is work out there that's being that, that is doing this. Um, it's just that it's, it's, it's on the margins of development and not on the mainstream. And, and so, you know, that's, that's a little bit the question. And uh, it, it actually interests me, you know, when you say, well, strategies of isomorphism, we didn't use the word because I'm trying not to. Um, but you know, isomorphism is, is when you do what people, what gives you legitimacy. And you know, um, my colleague Land Pritchard often says, actually you find the people who operate the best on the margins and who are actually doing the stuff that matters. If you go to the World Bank, they are also the ones who have the billion dollar loans. They, they do all the stuff that they need to so that they can create the space for them to do the cool stuff. And I think there is something about us using strategies, sometimes both strategies at the same time, which is where I'd get to Andrew and say, I think you are pigeonholing it, um, but it's, it's not unfair to do so because I think I'm intending that a little bit. Um, why the, the PDIA, a couple of things that I tried to do. The first was to provide real evidence and say, this is happening and it, 
I'm actually describing a process that is in place, um, uh, was because I'm trying to construct an alternative. The reason why I suggest it as the alternative is because I'm trying to construct an alternative. Y you know, and and, and um, this conversation is precisely why it's there. It's not so that everyone says, the last thing that I want is for people to adopt PDIA as a solution. Because that is what I'm critiquing. <laughs> If, if what we do is we start a process where people start saying, how does this make sense, and ask about these questions, I think that that's, that's success here. So um, here's what I would say, though, is part of my argument is the process has to reflect the context. Why I think PDA is a very relevant thing, and actually we should pay a lot of attention to it, is that I think that it does reflect the context of development. Here's a few things. I think all of the three things that make institutional reform happen, if they really are relevant, and I think you know, normatively they make sense, yeah, we don't do very well in development. We're not very transparent. You know, all of those things don't work very well for us. So PDIA is, if you're in an environment where you have really low holes, really small holes, you don't have much capacity. Uh, you know, we were talking earlier and I was saying it, it's interesting to me that in the 1980s Sweden had done some multi-year budgeting reforms that didn't work very well, and, or, or they, but they had people who could actually do multi-year forecasting. We don't have those people in a lot of developing countries, so you get the IMF forecasts. Now people say, well, at least you've got a forecast. No, it's worse than that because it's an IMF forecast. There's something that goes with that, right? So the fact that you don't have forecasters, you think about the reforms that you can't do. So I say if you have a low capacity environment where, where the most fundamental capacities are not there, okay? If you have a situation where getting any politically coherent support for reform is, is very, very difficult and nothing is impossible, um, but very difficult. If, if you have a situation where you don't have transparency, how do you do reform? And where you need a hell of a lot of it and you need it fast. So my sense is PDA was kind of determined for this is you have to create the hole before you fill it. And I think sometimes the new design approach maybe doesn't necessarily do that at least, and that isn't actually what I'm critiquing. The solutions-based development approach never does that. So how do you create the hole? You create the hole by entering through problems that people care about because, because that opens the situation for you. But that doesn't necessarily mean that you can then construct a peg because you still don't have the capacity and because you're still on a limited leash. So that's where the idea of kind of step-by-step -step iteration comes in. Start, start where you are and start with something small that you can do with the capacity you have and build the capacity as you move along. Meaning, build the abilities people have, build the political appetite, build the awareness that, damn it, we can do stuff. Like, we don't need the bank and we don't need the fund. We actually can do things. Um, I think that this is also the way in which you deal with the sustainability issue because built into your reform process, you're building the political support, you're building the norms, and you're building the capabilities that give it life. So I would say this, I don't think that this is relevant all the time. If you want to build a road, you don't need to PDA it. Okay? You need a good engineer, and you need someone who says, do the thing, right? I, I really believe that. I even think in governance, we might have things like that. Uh, hell, we've proved that you can pass a lot of laws without PDA. Okay? And, and I'm not suggesting for one minute that passing a law is an easy thing to do. And I'm not suggesting for one minute that you don't need political will and you don't need people who can write the laws. But we found that you can get the political will by having the IMF threaten you. And we found that you can, you can get the capability by hiring external consultants like us. Well, what, we haven't found, what we've also found, though, is that solving the next problem of implementing the law is not quite so easy and requires a different approach. And that's kind of exactly why I'm suggesting it. Um, I also would suggest that it might be an issue to do with process. I think that in a lot of the places we jump to the solution and the big loan to implement the solution, you know. So we're going to do the, the accounting system that's going to cost $100 million before we know really that that accounting system makes any sense. Now, I think what development maybe needs is a way in which you can have some flexible funding for some incubation for PDIA until you have some idea about what might work because you actually have built some political support, et cetera, and then you move into the big project to do the system. My sense is that this is what the private sector does all the time. The private sector doesn't immediately jump to a $100 million project where they have no buy-in and they don't know if they can pull it off. They kind of experiment a little bit, build a bit of capacity, get their ideas about what they're going to do, and then they, then they go and get the big bank loan. 
We don't have anything really like that in development at the moment. But we have had, and you know, these are not original ideas. In the 1998, the World Bank developed a thing called the Learning and Innovation Loan. So you want to say, where's the appetite for failure? They developed a mechanism for this because there were people saying we need this. $5 million loan. Here's the problem. It's the incentives of the organization. 148 laws have been used since 1998. 131 of them were used between 1998 and 2002. So that means in the last decade, 17 people have used this mechanism that gives you flexibility to find out what the hell you want to do before you're going to do it. <laughs> and the reason is this. It's a $5 million loan that goes through exactly the same process of approval as anything else, which means you have to go to the board, you have to have fights with people, you have to build your political constituencies. At the end of it, there's no results because it's a learning, right? And by the time it comes out, whatever learning is going to happen, you is going to go into a loan that the person who replaces you at the end of that three years is going to actually benefit from. So the, the incentives of the organization run completely against using this, even though they actually created a mechanism for it. The last thing for Claire is this is inherently political. Absolutely. And the question I don't think is kind of, well, how does, it, how does this happen? So what's the role of external people? Well, I think that is the question. I think it's a valid question because I think there, there is a role because we forced ourselves into the equation. And the thing that I was saying to you yesterday is if this is kind of like a process that is a, an evolutionary process whereby people are working things out, it, elites are addressing problems and they're kind of moving along, like I kind of think it is. Um, my concern is that somewhere in the early 1990s, the international development community told the developing world that that's not what it's about. They came up with a set of indicators and answers and said, you don't need to ask the question, you don't need to go through any process, and you don't need to construct problems and build political coalitions. All you need to do is copy Sweden, or whoever. <laughs> and they created indicators that actually say, this is what you need to do, and, and just do it. And it worries me now that you almost have a dependency on that kind of behavior. But it is inherently political, so the question is, how do we get the community to own up to that politicalness, or to get the hell out of it? Thanks very much. Thanks to Matt, to Philip, and to Pear. That was a great discussion, and um, I think we'll Thank be you. continuing it. But many thanks for visiting us, Matt, and we really enjoyed having you. Thanks, thanks for having us. <laughs> okay, sorry we overrun slightly, but uh, anyway, many thanks also to the audience and for the great questions. Thank sorry you. for anyone I didn't get to.